Well, good evening. So good to see you. I'm so glad to be, I was going to say I'm glad to be here, but I've got to be honest. I'm glad to be anywhere. <laughs> Seriously, after what happened to me in Little Rock, Arkansas. I went to Little Rock to speak at a charity event, and this pastor picked me up from the airport, and he's taking me to the event, and we're chatting in the car. And along the way, he said, yeah, he said, I, I told a young woman in our church, I said, Lee Strobel's going to speak tonight. And she said, oh, the guy who wrote The Case for Christ, is he still living? <laughs> so I'm glad to be anywhere after that, but I'm especially glad to be here at Sage Mount. What a terrific church. What a great uh, show up, uh, people showing up tonight, you all being here to talk about important matters of faith and evidence and truth. Um, I'm a new t uh, Texan, a new Houston. I moved to Houston uh, recently. Yeah, I love Houston. What a great city. Leslie, my wife and I moved, uh, we live uh, just north of Houston in the Woodlands, which if you get on from here, if you get on the I-45, it's about a three-day drive up there. <laughs> and uh, so we, we, we got our phone number assigned to us, our home telephone number, by the phone company. And you may think, yeah, so what? Well, it was a big deal for us. Because no kidding, when we lived in Chicago, the phone number they gave us was one digit away from the cab company. Seriously. So at 2 in the morning on Saturday nights, these drunk guys in bars would be calling for a cab, and they'd misdial, and our phone would ring. And it was bad enough getting waking up in the middle of the night, but then you had to get up, get dressed, get in the car. <laughs> it was such a hassle. But I got a good number now in Houston, so I think we're going to be okay. Uh, my uh, grandchildren, my two oldest granddaughters, live right around the corner, and they are into Texas. They moved here right about the same time we did, but they are totally Texan these days. My 12-year-old granddaughter, Abigail, she's got the cowboy hat. She's got the cowboy boots. She's taking horseback riding lessons. She is totally into it. You know how I know she's really a Texan now? We were at dinner. There's no kidding. We were at dinner recently, and uh, she said, could I pray for dinner? And we said, sure. So this is what she prayed. God is good. God is great. Thank you for the Lone Star State. <laughs> that's a Texan. That, that's, a, that's a true Texan. So, Well, I think, you know, there's, there's no better way to start off any talk, especially in a church, than by quoting Jesus. So I'd like to go to uh, the words of Jesus in Matthew chapter 5, the Sermon on the Mount, the greatest sermon ever delivered where Jesus looked out over a crowd 2,000 years ago. But by extension, I believe he was looking down through history and he was looking at you tonight. And here's what he said. He said, you are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and then put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine among others, that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. What was Jesus saying there? What does he want us to take from that? I think, I think he was saying, I want, if you're a follower of mine, I want you to live lives that are like salt, that, that make people thirst for God. I want you to live lives that are like light, that shine my message of hope and grace and love and eternal life and redemption and hope and truth into dark areas of despair and confusion. And the question I want to deal with in these next few minutes is what does that look like in the 21st century? Well, my buddy Mark Middleberg and I uh, wrote a book about this, and we thought long and hard about a title, and we decided to call it The Unexpected Adventure. Because we really believe that if three things are true of you, if you are motivated to engage with people on spiritual conversations, if you make yourself available to do that, if you're prepared to do that, you never know what's going to happen. Could start out to be an average and routine day, but God might open up an opportunity for you to have a conversation with someone that could change their life and that could change their eternity. You just never know. Now, Sometimes it does not unfold like you think it's going to. Sometimes something embarrassing happens. You ever try to share your faith and something embarrassing happened? 
Yeah, I had the most embarrassing thing happen. Oh, man. My buddy Mark and I were down south speaking at a conference years ago. And um, next day we had to go home. So we had to get some breakfast before we got to the airport. And we saw one of these Cracker Bear restaurants. And I'd never been to one. He said, well, we ought to go. I said, okay. And we noticed they have rocking chairs on the front porch, right? And people sit in them while they're waiting for a table, and they people watch. Well, in order for us to get to the front door of the restaurant, we had to walk in front of two people in rocking chairs. First one was a young woman, about 18 years old, dark hair, dark eyes, quite attractive, young man about the same age, sitting next door. We got to walk in front of them to get to the front door. It's not a big deal, right? So we're walking along, and just as I step in front of this young woman, I hear her say, what's a deist? And I thought, I just wrote a book about that. So I turned on my heel, and I looked her in the eye, and I said, young lady, a deist is someone who believes that God created the universe, and then he walked away. I said, a deist is someone who believes that God sort of wound up the universe like a giant clock and is just letting it tick down. I said, a deist believes that God is distant and disinterested in us. But I said, that's not what the evidence shows. I began to give her the evidence for God's involvement with the cosmos, God's involvement with humankind. Started to give her the evidence of cosmology and physics and biochemistry and genetics. I'm just laying this stuff on her, and she's looking at me, and her eyes are getting bigger and bigger, and, and I'm on a roll now. You can't stop me. Started talking about Jesus entering into human history, the incarnation, his miracles, his death. I started to give her the evidence that Jesus rose from the dead. And she's staring at me, her eyes are getting bigger and bigger. And I turned to my friend Mark and I said, can you believe this? We happened to walk in front of him. She said, what's a deist? My friend said, Lee. She said, buenos dias. <laughs> yeah. I really wish that were a joke. That's what happened. She was freaking out, I will tell you that. She was freaking out. But you know what the, the good news was? The ice was already broken. <laughs> How do you not get into a spiritual conversation at that point, right? And turned out she was there with her boyfriend for the state track meet. And they, turned us, they took us back to the hotel room where the coach was and all the athletes, and we got to talk about Jesus for about 45 minutes. So it turned out all right. But man, that was embarrassing. <laughs> that, that was embarrassing. But I'll tell you what, when we live on the evangelistic edge, we're prepared, we're available, and we're, we're seeking opportunities to engage with people in spiritual conversations. Every aspect of the Christian life is heightened. Our, our worship takes on a whole new dimension because we're worshiping the God of the second chance who loves our lost friends more than we do. It's when our prayer life takes on a whole new dimension because we're praying, God, help me, <laughs> give me the words to say. It's when our Bible study takes on a whole new dimension because we're not just looking for abstract theological truths. We're looking for something that might help reach a friend with the gospel. It's when our dependence on God is at its greatest because we know that apart from the work of the Holy Spirit, there's nothing we can do in and of ourselves lead anybody to faith. But this is where the action is in the Christian life. How can we live on that evangelistic edge? Well, I gave some thought to this, and I thought, well, what if Jesus physically lived in my house? What would I learn from the master in terms of how he would interact with the neighbors and people who he would encounter along the way? And so as I studied the life of Jesus, there was so much I learned about serving people, about being authentic. There's a lot of things we can learn. But I'm going to focus in this short talk just on two things that I think we could learn from Jesus if he physically lived in our house, about reaching out to others. The first thing is this. I think that before talking to his neighbor about his heavenly father, he would talk to his heavenly father about his neighbor. He would pray, right? I mean, before Jesus embarked on anything of significance, he, he took it to the father in prayer. I mean, think about it. When you, when you read the uh, New Testament description of the crucifixion of Jesus in the original Greek, one of the things you notice is that the imperfect tense of the Greek suggests that Jesus did not just say it once, but he kept repeating it all through the torture of the crucifixion. While the nails were being driven through his hands, while the nails were being driven through his feet, he kept praying, Father, forgive them, Father, forgive them, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. 
the prayers of Jesus Christ for people so spiritually depraved that they were torturing to death the Son of God, his prayers for lost people continued right up until his final gasps on the cross. And as British pastor John Stott said, in light of that, how can we justify not praying consistently and fervently and expectantly for lost people in our lives? I mean, I, I, I understand theologically we can't by our prayers force someone against their will to give their lives to Christ. But you know what? I'm just naive enough to believe James when he said the prayers of righteous people make a difference. I believe they do. I've seen it. I've seen it. I remember once uh, when I was a pastor up at Willow Creek Church in Chicago, we were baptizing 700 new followers of Jesus that day. And it was a great celebration. They were going to come up and be baptized and... and um, we, we explained the gospel and what baptism is all about, and we said if you want to bring somebody with you for the, up for the baptism, maybe the person who led you to the Lord or a spouse, that's great. And, and so people started to come up to be baptized, and this woman comes up to me. And she was, in, I don't know, maybe 65 years old, and uh, there was a man with her. And he was a tough-looking bird, like a construction worker type, you know? Just, he probably didn't even use a hammer, just a, a fist to nail things, you know? You know what I'm saying? Just a tough guy. So I said, you're here, to, to the woman, I said, you're here to be baptized. She said, yes, I am. I said, have you received Jesus as your Lord and Savior? She said, oh, with all my heart. I said, that's great. And I was going to baptize her. And I, I usually didn't do this, but I felt the Holy Spirit prompting me. I, I, I turned to the man and I said, well, excuse me, sir, are you her husband? He said, well, yes, I am. I said, have you given your life to Jesus? And he glared at me and his face kind of screwed up. And I thought he was going to hit me or something. I didn't know. And then he burst into tears. In front of thousands of people, he's weeping and he's sobbing. And he says, no, I haven't, but I want to right now. I said, wait a minute, time out. Can we do this? Okay, great. So this guy, in front of thousands of people, repents of his sin, receives forgiveness through Christ, and I baptize him and his wife together. Now, after the service, I'm walking down off the platform. Another woman I didn't know comes running up to me, throws her arms around me. She's weeping. She's sobbing. All she can say is, nine years, nine years, nine years. I said, who are you? And wh <laughs> What do you mean, nine years? She says, that's my brother who you just led to the Lord and baptized. I have been praying for that man for nine long years. And for nine years, she said, for nine years, I've not seen one glimmer of interest in God, but look what God did today. And you know what my first thought was? There was a woman who was glad she didn't stop praying in year eight. Who have you stopped praying for? Is there someone you love, maybe someone you went to school with or a colleague at work or something? You used to pray for them, but we almost sometimes make the decision for them. We think, oh, they'll never come to faith, and we give up. And I think this woman would say, don't give up. I talked to a man once who prayed for his lost brother for 48 years and 348 days. He counted, and his brother came to faith on his deathbed. Who have you given up on? What if we all brought the picture of a person we've given up on into our minds right now and we just committed to say this coming week, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to contact them, I'm going to email them, call them, get together with them, whatever, and pray that God might open up an opportunity to talk to them about the Lord. In fact, here's a convicting question. At least it was for me. I, I, see if it is for you. But somebody once said to me, what if tonight, you go home, you're alone in your room. What if tonight Jesus physically appeared to you in your bedroom? And he looked at you and he said, I am going to answer every single prayer that you prayed last week. If he said that to you tonight, would there be anybody new in the kingdom of God tomorrow? Are we praying? I don't know if you saw the movie that they made, The Case for Christ, about my, my story of going from atheism to faith, but if you did, one of the things I'm sure you notice is my wife, after she came to faith in Christ, and I was still the atheist husband, how she prayed for me 
And the person in the letter to the Lord gave her a verse, Ezekiel 36, 26, that says, Moreover, I will give you a new heart, and I will put a new spirit within you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And my wife, this whole two years that I went on this investigative journey, looking at the evidence for the resurrection and so, behind the scenes, my wife every day was praying that verse for me. Who should you be praying for? Who might God put in your heart tonight to renew prayers for? Now, it's easy to say, yeah, 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 we ought to pray more. I mean, that's an easy thing. But I want to suggest something um, to kind of harness that. And that's an idea that I picked up uh, that they were using in, in South Korea years ago. And we've implemented this at two, actually three churches now where I've been a teaching pastor, and God has blessed it. And I want to encourage you, I know some of you from other churches in the area and from this great church of Sagemont, I want to give you an idea. Here's the idea. You get everybody together in the church about a couple of months out from Easter. Easter's coming up. Now's the perfect time. And you all get together and say, let's all agree to pray for one lost person for one minute at 1 o'clock every day between now and Easter. And one of the things to be praying for is an opportunity to share the gospel with them and to invite them to come to Easter services because we know that God does something extraordinary at Easter time, doesn't he? We had one guy raise his hand and say, can I pray for two people at 2 o'clock for two minutes? No! No, there's always one overachiever in any group. No! Pray for one person at one minute at one o'clock. And so everybody from the church would stop wherever they were. Their alarm thing would go off or their iPhone and they'd stop. They'd pray for that one minute. We, had one, we gave people little cards with 111 on it and a line. We said, write down the name of the person you're praying for just to remind you. But don't show it to the person, you know. But this one young woman in our church showed it to her friend. Look, I'm praying for you, you, one person. <laughs> for one minute at one o'clock every day because I love you and I want you to know Jesus the way I do. And her friend said, yeah, 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 okay, thanks a lot, appreciate that, you know. Within two weeks, that unsaved young woman was in the shower getting ready to go to work and the water is cascading down on her and the Holy Spirit seized her soul. She got down on her knees and received Jesus as her Lord and Savior. And as a Baptist, I love this, you know, a conversion and a baptism at the same time. (laughs) That's American ingenuity, right there. That's efficiency. <laughs> but wouldn't it be great if someday, I've been planting the seed, I feel like Johnny Appleseed, planting the 111 idea all around the country, because my dream is someday every church in America, every Christian in America, will be praying for one lost person at one o'clock for one minute, and we'll see what happens. We did this at, when I was a teaching pastor with Rick Warren out at Saddleback Church. We had the largest Easter Ever. More people came to faith than ever before. But I'm telling you, I think if Jesus physically lived in my house, he would pray specifically and consistently and fervently for lost people in the neighborhood. The second thing I want to mention is that if Jesus physically lived in my house, I believe he would let all the neighbors know, hey, guess what? My door is always open if you have a question. Got a doubt? Got a hesitation? Got an objection? Come on in, bring the Starbucks, we'll sit on the floor, we'll talk about it. I mean, I can't think of any incident where Jesus slam-dunked anybody that came to him with a sincere question. Can you? I mean, think about it. Uh, If anybody should have known without a shadow of a doubt the identity of Jesus being the Son of God, it was John the Baptist. John the Baptist once pointed to Jesus and, and said, Behold, the Lamb of God! who takes away the sin of the world. John the Baptist baptized Jesus. He saw the heavens open up. He heard the voice of the Father. This is my son in whom I'm well pleased. John the Baptist once pointed to Jesus and said, I have seen and I testify this is the Son of God. But what happens? He gets arrested. He gets thrown in prison. Question. What happens to a lot of us when tough times come? Doubts begin to creep in, don't they? And so here John is in prison. Now he's got some hesitations. Now he's not 100% sure. He's got a little doubt coming in. So what does he do? He gets a couple friends together. He says, look, go track down Jesus and just ask him point blank. Are you the one we've been waiting for or are we to wait for somebody else? 
So his buddies track down, hey, Jesus, yeah, you know John. Well, he got busted. <laughs> and he's freaking out. And he just wants to know, would you just tell us point blank, are you the one that we've been waiting for? We'd wait for somebody else. Now, here's the issue. Does Jesus get angry at John for raising a doubt, a question? Does he say, how dare John have the temerity to express any hesitation about my identity? No. Jesus says to those followers of John, quote, go back to John and tell him what you have seen and heard. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cured, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is preached to the poor. In other words, go back to John and tell him about the evidence you've seen with your own eyes that convinces you that I am the one I claim to be. So they go back, they tell John, but here's the issue. Has this now disqualified John from any role in the kingdom of God because he dared to express a hesitation? No. It's after this incident that Jesus gets up before a group and says, among those born of women, there's no one greater than John. John the doubter. John, the guy who dared to ask a question. Friends, it is okay for us as followers of Jesus to have questions. It's even okay to have some doubts. As long as we do what John did and we pursue answers. And you know what? We're all told in 1 Peter 3.15, you've heard that verse, that we're, our assignment as Christians is to help our spiritually confused friends Get past those spiritual sticking points, those questions, those doubts, those objections that are holding them up in their journey toward Christ. So many of our friends just have a few questions, a few hesitations, a few doubts, and if we can help them get answers to that, they can make great progress toward the cross. Because here's the deal. We have a credible faith. We have a faith that has answers to the toughest questions. I've seen this demonstrated a thousand times. I remember, I remember years ago, um, after I came to faith, I was an atheist and, and uh, came to faith in Christ, ended up uh, going into the ministry at Willow Creek Church. And, um, and one of my friends from my atheist days was the national spokesman for American Atheists Incorporated, one of the top atheists in the country. And so after I became a Christian, of course, I wanted to share Jesus with them, Right. So we would talk and we would debate and banter about Jesus. And one day he looked at me and said, Ah, oh, Strobel, you Christians are all alike. I said, what do you mean? He said, oh, you'll give the case for Christ. You'll give the evidence for God. But you won't then give the evidence against God and just let people make up their own minds. I said, oh, yeah? I said, I'll tell you what. You go get the smartest, the most articulate atheist on planet Earth, and I will fly him to Willow Creek Church. I will allow him to stand on our platform and proclaim the case for atheism. But I'm going to get a Christian. And that Christian is going to present the case for Christ, and then he's going to debate your atheist, and we'll just let people make up their own minds. He said, you wouldn't do that. I said, oh, yeah? We shook hands on it? My very next thought, I... Should have asked the senior pastor before. <laughs> Oops, this ball was rolling. This thing took off. Like, oh my goodness. Chicago attributed four advanced articles on this debate. Um, talk radio, talk television. We're buzzing about it all over Chicago. Why? Because the church said, we're not afraid to have an intellectual shootout. We're not afraid to put our faith to the test. I started to get phone calls from radio stations around the country. Can we broadcast this debate live? Sure. Pretty soon we had 117 radio stations coast to coast going to broadcast this thing live. One radio network sent commentators like it was a prize fight or something. You know, there's a jab by the Christian, think the atheist on the ropes. <laughs> it was unbelievable. No kidding, the night of the debate, traffic was gridlocked within two miles of our church. We opened the doors to our auditorium. People ran down the aisles to get a seat. When's the last time you saw someone run into a church? <laughs> we had 7,778 people show up. We overflowed our auditorium. We had hookup, uh, closed circuit television in various rooms on our campus. We had coast to coast radio going to go on the air, and I'm going to moderate the debate. I'm getting ready. I'm pacing backstage. I'm nervous. And one of our elders comes up to me and says, So, Strobel, we are going to win this, aren't we? <laughs> 
So the debate begins, and we chose as our representative of Christianity a man I consider to be perhaps the greatest defender of the faith in the world today, two earned PhDs, professor at Biola University and also at Houston Baptist University, Dr. William Lane Craig. You probably know that name. And he gets up, and he stands by the platform, and he gives the most powerful 25-minute summation of the evidence for the existence of God and the truth of Christianity that you have ever heard. And I wanted to cheer, but I was a moderator. I had to be neutral. Thank you, Dr. Craig. And now the atheist, Professor Zindler. (laughs) Good luck, buddy. So they chose their best guy. So he gets up, and he stands behind the podium, and he's about to open his mouth. But we didn't tell him one thing. Not that he would have cared. But we didn't let him know that right where he was standing, underneath the platform, was a room. And that room was filled for the entire two and a half hours of the debate with Christians who were praying that the case for Christ would go out with all his convicting power and the case for atheism would be recognized for the bankrupt philosophy that it is. And if you've seen the video of that debate, it's on YouTube, you can watch it. You know God answered that prayer. Because we had people vote. What's your spiritual condition as you come in? Who won the debate? What's your spiritual condition as you leave? Initially, we just took the ballots of the non-believers, the skeptics, the agnostics, the atheists. Just among that group, having heard the case for Christ and the case for atheism, over 82% said the case for Christ was by far the most compelling. And 47 people walked in as confirmed atheists, heard both sides, and walked out as followers of Jesus Christ. And you know what else? Not one person became an atheist. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. Friends, we have an unfair advantage in the marketplace of ideas. We have truth on our side. Now, is my takeaway, therefore, we all ought to go around debating people? No. I'm not a debater. You're probably not a debater. That's a skill that not many people have. I think for us, the key word is not debate, it's dialogue, it's conversations, it's friendships, it's relationships, it's creating a safe place where we do more listening than talking. When we validate this person as being valuable in the eyes of God, where we respect them as being on a journey, where we are not judgmental toward them, and where we help them get answers to these tough questions. The key thing is, it's okay that we don't have every answer on the tip of our tongue. Sometimes the best thing we can say when somebody asks a tough question is, that's a great question. I have no idea how to answer it. But let's find an answer together. And, you know, Craig Hazen was talking about all these resources available here. We can use those to walk them through answers to the tough questions that they have. So, friends, um, when we pray for people, when we build relationships with them, when we're gentle and respectful, as 1 Peter 3.15 talks about, as Craig mentioned, and when we make ourselves available, God will take us on unexpected adventures, and it will be the joy of our life. And I'll just end with one quick story. It's my favorite one favorite adventure God took me on in my life. I was a new Christian, and um, it was right before Easter, and I was a newspaper editor in Chicago. And I was packing my stuff up to go home, and, and I felt the Holy Spirit prompting me that I needed to go into the business office of the newspaper and invite my atheist friend to come to Easter services at our church. And I thought, this is great. If God has prompted me to do this, he's probably going to repent right now. This is going to be great. I just... I got it all figured out, right? So I walk with great confidence over to the business office, and I walk in, and I look, and there's my friend sitting behind his desk, and nobody else. I don't see anybody else. I thought, this is great. Thank you, Lord. So I went up to him. I said, how you doing? He said, I'm doing great. I said, hey, you know, Easter's coming up. He said, Strobel, you know I'm an atheist. I don't observe Easter. I said, yeah, 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 I know. But Easter is when we remember the resurrection of Jesus. He said, oh, he wasn't resurrected. I said, well, you know, actually, there's good historical evidence that he was. I began giving him the case for the resurrection, the case for Easter, some of the evidence. And I went on for a little while, and I realized this wasn't working. So I said, I got to take another approach. So I said, let me ask you this. 
you have any questions about God? He said, no. Oh. And let me ask you this. Do you ever think about God? He said, no. I said, well, wait a minute. You like music, right? He said, oh, yeah, I love music. Well, I, he, I said, our church has got great music. Why don't you and your wife come to Easter services with us at our church? I think you'll love the music. And he looked at me and he said, I don't want to go to your stupid church. Okay, hey, listen, <laughs> if you ever have a question, uh, you know where my office is, I'll see you later. And I walked out and I thought, what was that about? Did I get my wires crossed? Why did I feel so compelled to go, invite this guy to Easter services, talk about the evidence for the resurrection, and he shut me down. And it bothered me for years, because to this day, he's still an atheist. But then several years after that, by then I was a pastor, and I just preached on a weekend. A guy came up to me and said, could I shake your hand and thank you for the spiritual influence you've had in my life? I said, great, but who are you? He said, let me tell you my story. He said, a few years ago, I lost my job. And I didn't have any savings. I thought I was going to lose my house, my car. I didn't know what to do. I needed a, a job. I needed to earn some money. So I called a friend of mine who ran a newspaper. I said, do you have any odd jobs I can do to earn a buck for a while? And the guy said, well, can you tile floors? And I, I said, yeah, I've tiled our bathroom. I think I can tile floors. He said, well, we need some tile installed and repaired at the newspaper. And if you can do that, we can pay it for a while. So he said, I went to work at the newspaper. He said, one day, not long before Easter, I was in the business office of the newspaper, and I was on my hands and knees behind this big desk working on the tile on the floor, and you walked in the door, and I don't even think you knew I was there. <laughs> and you start talking to this guy about God, and you start giving the evidence for the resurrection, and you start inviting him to church, and this guy was shutting you down. <laughs> but I'm on my hands and knees listening to all this on the floor, and my heart's beating fast, and I'm thinking, I need God. I need to go to church. So he said, as soon as you left, I picked up the phone, I called my wife, I said, we're going to church this Easter. She said, what? I said, yeah. He said, we came to your church that Easter. I came to faith, my wife came to faith, and our teenage son came to faith, and I just wanted to thank you. And I thought, you know, this is, this is a new form of evangelism, ricochet evangelism. <laughs> you know, you share your faith, it bounces off a hard heart. You don't know where it's going to go. Friends, this is the unexpected adventure of the Christian life. You don't want to miss this. We don't get a chance to do this in heaven. This is our one opportunity. So I'm so glad you're investing your time to be here this weekend. Let me pray for you that God would use you as salt and light, stronger salt and brighter light than ever before. Father, I pray a blessing on each person here. Help them be stronger salt, brighter light for your glory to reach people with your message of hope and redemption and grace. We pray this in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. amen.